of marine ecosystem. Today is the last session of this virtual workshop. It's being live streamed via the YouTube channel of the IWC, where it is currently available for a short time in case some participant cannot be present at all sessions. There is also a SharePoint site available where participants can download background information. Please mute your microphone when not speaking and use the raise hand function if you wish to ask a question or make a point. And please introduce yourself and your organization when it is the first time asking for the floor. I would also take the opportunity to thank the speakers for their contributions and remind them to send a summary of their presentation if they haven't done it yet. One or two, two three paragraphs uh, to be included on the workshop report, it's okay. Over the past two sessions of this workshop, we learned about the outcomes of the IWC CMS scientific workshop on cetacean and ecosystem functioning and we deepen it into the importance of threats shared by marine megafauna to relate to ecosystem functions and services. We then started to dig into new socioeconomic perspective and frameworks. We receive a masterclass into market and non-market techniques of economic evaluation for ecosystem services. We were, we were also introduced into the United Nations system of environmental economic accounting and we were challenged to think about enormous potential related to common asset trust and nature-based solutions. And we were also warned about the, possibility, the possible impact climate change and other threats could have over the current scenario in the future and their impact on the related ecosystem services. We also have an interesting discussion over the scientific committee table to clarify concepts to be used and how any particular cetacean threats could be or not related to a socioeconomic valuation. A small group was created to further discuss this topic before today's session and, it, and they have a meeting last Friday. So we will come back later with its report. At today's session, we have the last two presentations on co-developing good government to integrate socioeconomic data in marine science policy that will be given by Dr. Selina Stead, and also regarding the past, present, and future of the ecosystem services provided by cetacean carcasses given by Dr. Martina Cuayoto. We will then receive the report of the smart working group and we'll have final discussion on future directions and recommendations from this workshop to the commission. So now I would like to introduce you Dr. Selina Stead. She is marine biologist and tropical scientist. She's also professor at School of Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds. She specializes in environmental governments and has expertise in coral reef ecosystems, fisheries, aquaculture, and marine protected area. She will now introduce us into the new approach of co-developing good government governance to integrate socioeconomic data in marine science policy. Welcome Dr. Steed, and thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, for that lovely um, introduction and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for also for the opportunity to give this presentation. I will just share my screen if you can bear with me. And hopefully you can all see that OK. So I'm going to talk about um, good governance um, some research that I've been doing for several years now um, with a particular emphasis on linking socioeconomic data to marine science policy. And I'm using experience both as a researcher 
but I've also had a foot in government for nearly 30 years, and I'm currently a UK government chief scientific advisor for the Marine Management Organization. So just to show as well that I have read the terms of the reference of the workshop and hopefully have done my homework question, the main point on this slide that I wanted to get across is that we should remember that science and policy, um, they're often siloed, but actually when I'm in government, I often have to remind myself that terrestrial issues often get prioritized more than marine issues. So the needs of people um, is often a higher consideration. And I just want to put that as a big picture. So let me focus on the issue for this presentation. The key issue is that, in my view, there's a lack of integrated marine resource planning, with cetaceans being the main resource for this workshop, to deliver co-benefits across multiple goals and sectors. So goals such as conservation of cetaceans is often managed in government very separately to fisheries, and fisheries is often very separate to the marine environment. And given that um, communities, socioeconomic livelihoods and jobs is in a separate part of government, my point is um, the problem is that governments, institutions often lack a systems approach to integrating what we call the three pillars of sustainability, the social, environmental and economic data. And I've really enjoyed the presentations this week, um, especially some of the masterclasses. But the solutions that I've been working on is how to co-develop participatory governance, the main decision making, but involving people at an early stage where you can actually link socioeconomic drivers that influence human behavior. And I feel very strongly engagement is not consult consultation. Engagement is involving people from the start. If you're going to really co-create policy that's likely to be sorted, uh, supported sorry, and management. So the benefits I've been working on is trying to integrate strategies that better balance economic, social and environmental considerations, the co-benefits. But the so what? Why is this really important? Well, we need a coherent strategy to balance economic prosperity, um, biodiversity conservation and social impacts. And I hope through the examples I give you that you can see the sorts of methods we've been using. And here I'm gonna talk about two techniques. So the aim of this paper is to show how we've been using national policy workshops where we can really develop an outline for a policy. So if you wanted to develop an outline of a policy for cetaceans, in one day, it can be done. It takes several months to get the right people at the right time to do that. And I'm going to show you this in a multi-level governance framework. What I mean by that is linking decision-making at a local, a national, a regional and international level. And I'm gonna talk about two methods. I'm going to quickly talk through the use of Bayesian belief networks to help visualize socioeconomic data. This was important earlier in my career because I worked with a lot of natural scientists that were very skeptical about the use of social data. And I also have to inform um, when I'm speaking with government why it's important. And then the main focus of this paper, I wanted to really share the policy cycle review workshops because to me, they have been quite a game changer in getting people to understand who is or who is not involved in management. Um, and I hope um, some of you may even try some of the methods I'm going to describe. So I wanted to um, quite quickly go over this case study of how we use Bayesian belief networks to visualize socioeconomic data. This was some work I did in Tanzania. And actually what we were finding was that um, a lot of cetaceans were being caught as bycatch or they were being targeted. Sometimes it was allowed, sometimes it wasn't allowed, but we took a different approach. So the hypothesis was that if you understand the social and economic dependence of fishers or communities, whether that's um, directly on cetaceans or otherwise, 
Often governments don't, governments don't bring in transitional arrangements. They say you suddenly they've got to be a ban. But if you make a ban and they don't have all their alternatives to income or food, they're often not going to support. So Tanzania said, OK, we recognize there's a problem with the fisheries. They were concerned about a lot of the bycatch of cetaceans. Um, we would like to see whether introducing sea cucumber aquaculture as an alternative or supplement to take pressure off the cetacean bycatch would work. However, where do you start this um, project? There's often a lot of well-intentioned projects at conservation that don't work. So we did interviews in Zanzibar, um, north and south of Dar es Salaam in Kanduchi and Biyuni. And um, we asked various information on socioeconomic factors. Let me just explain. So we asked people, um, we wanted their age, years of education, material styles of life, transport, household income, gender, social network strengths, so we understood how they passed information, time available if they were interested in an alternative um, livelihood, also how dependent they were on fishing and other occupations. And so we asked this question, particularly those that were um, directly or indirectly fishing for cetaceans, um, what likelihood would they be to consider something else? And the government wanted to particularly know they said, well, Selena, we want to focus on low income household um, that would normally find it difficult to do other occupations. And we quickly found that we were a 55 percent of all the different communities would consider um, sea cucumbers as an alternative to cetacean fishing. And then we found they said, well, 55 percent is quite low. But we found, well, if you targeted those that had um, an initial awareness, education, you set your Bayesian model um, to test for this, around about 63 percent would consider changing to another livelihood. And then we also found, well, that's not quite enough. And we found that if you identified which members of a community, which fishermen, um, that 77% said they would consider switching from cetacean fishing to um, consider sea cucumber, not always as an alternative, but supplementary. What this also showed was actually it was those fishermen that were older or could no longer fish. So all I really wanted to show is that it took me quite a lot of years to explain why we also collect social data and how that can be helpful in choosing which community is more likely to try a livelihood or a new gear or a new conservation tool. That's important because if you can get the community, you, the first time you try something, it works, then other communities are more likely to try it. Then the main part of this presentation I wanted to focus on is these one day policy science reviews. And I'm going to give you the data from the BICAM project um, and show you some information that we collected from Kenya, Madagascar and Tanzania most recently. And there were three objectives to these workshops. First, we wanted to identify the key changes in fisheries um, and get a handle on how many were reliant on the cetaceans, directly targeting them, indirectly as bycatch. But we also wanted to look at how this was impacted by what we call a PESEL framework, look at political, economic, social, technological, legal and environmental considerations, and I'll show you the data for that. And then we wanted to see, well, how do these impact people's behavior, whether they were likely to support or not support a ban? And importantly, it's often not clear who is making the decisions, um, the governance about management, about the policy and the science. And I just want to show why it's important to map that. And this was part of a team, you might recognize some of the names here. Um, from a number of different institutions that were involved in this work. So, as I said, you can, when you get the right people around the table at the right time, we were able to do an outline of a policy strategy. But it took about six months because we could have, say, for the Minister for Environment, 
Um, then there was agreement, well, who's going to represent a particular fisher community? Well, which NGOs? Because you don't, you can't have the meters too large. So actually, the pre-meeting arrangements of who was representative is what took the time, and you need to get that right. So there was two objectives. And as I say, the first one to look at how fisheries changed over time was we use these decadal, um, um, so from 1950 to 2050, and then we use the economic, social, political, the PESEL framework. And we ask people to say, well, what's really impacted the fisheries, the communities um, over time? And we get them to also agree, well, what was negative, what was positive? So to really evaluate and think what worked and what didn't work. And then this is where the argument started and you need a really strong facilitator because you've got people competing for different resources. So who is collecting data, who was analyzing it, who was making the decisions? This was perhaps um, the most, where there was the most argument, shall we say, and, and I'll just take you through the data to explain why. So as I say, I'm just presenting the data from three countries, but I've tried this. I worked in, I've worked in the Caribbean. I've even tested this in UK and on my colleagues. And it is a really nice way. We often have clear goals, but it's important sometimes to get clarification on who does what. I won't go into detail, but this is the results where I showed you where we had from 1950 to 2050. And it shows you in terms of political, legal, environmental, social, economic, technological, as I said. But you can see that in you know, the early 1950s, when they started to um, get the Marine Protected Area Gazettement, um, there's quite a picture of MPAs. But it's quite interesting as you go through, and I'm going to show it in a little bit more detail, about the co-management, um, about the various different acts, social enterprise. But let me just show you how collecting all this information can be useful going forward. So on this one, we've taken the results, but we wanted to find out, well, to the right here, what was positive, to the left here, negative. So you can see initially from a legal perspective, the marine protected area was perceived as a negative impact. But actually, 20 years later, it was actually the environmental where particularly some of the spawning um, fish had been protected, where there was felt there was less cetacean bycatch started to have a positive impact. Again, I won't go through all of them. There was a structural adjustment program was considered negative. Um, where there was positives was some of the beach management units. This was where they were observing the catches. So they were able to look at compliance for um, not catching um, cetaceans. And then there was some um, negative that they introduced some livelihood projects here with the economic stimulus program. And again, you can see various projects that was negative and which one was positive. One of the biggest negative was seen as the, um, the mangrove ban because um, it wasn't enforced and a lot of the mangroves are still getting damaged. But then there was positives where legally the revised Fisheries Act, so getting support for cetacean bylaws and social enterprise, these were all examples of what hadn't worked and what had worked over different periods of time. And then, so we did that first to get the positive, the negatives over time. And then I just want to spend a little bit time on this um, policy cycle. And actually there are variations of this is work that was done by Stephen Olson and also Robin Mahon um, and Lucia um, Fanning. So what this is, is that what we say is that if a country has good fisheries governance or good cetacean governance, then we say that they must have five stages to a policy cycle. It, they must have the best available data, scientific information first. Secondly, they must have the expertise to analyze and interpret the data. Thirdly, it should be clear who's making the decisions about the different management. 
Fourthly, it should also be clear who's implementing the rules. Is there enforcement? Are there regulations? And importantly, who's reviewing and managing what particular management measure is working? So if you're introducing a ban on cetaceans or particular ban in particular gears, who's checking that those gill nets or whichever is actually being implemented? So what we do is we ask all the organizations that are there to list who is involved in the data collection, the analyses, decision-making about science, policy, who's implementing those management measures and who's evaluated. And this is where it's often, because it's people coming the first time, they will say, well, we do that. No, we do that. And you can see where there's overlap. You then find out um, where there are some gaps in information. So it's a very useful technique to clarify who's doing what and where. And so what I wanted to emphasize is that we have this um, as a test and we work out who is doing what, but we also say that you need to look at the policy cycle to clarify terms of reference, but equally you need to have good governance. And by good governance, I'm taking Roderick Rhodes um, European Commission white paper that says you must have cohesion, openness, participation, effectiveness, and accountability. I understand there's lots of different definitions of governance, but I take that as the five main principles. And for me, it's about um, to get trust, you've got to have transparency. So until you map all this out, it's difficult to get that. So just in the last couple of slides, as I summarize, then thinking about this workshop, um, I thought, well, it really is getting that systems thinking of cetaceans, but as part of megafauna, as part of the different ecosystems, aligning to how government policies work so that you can underpin a coherent strategy, but importantly, links the environmental data effectively with the social and economic drivers. My experience is that it's the quantifiable social data perceptions and attitudes that is missing. So in terms of gaps, I just wanted to um, recommend that the policy cycle workshops are great for identifying strengths and weaknesses in engagement with science policy, how to prioritize actions. You get the content specific, whether it's cetaceans per se or as part of a larger fisheries or conservation. And you also get better understanding of the social and economic indicators, how they've changed over time and how they've been influenced by political or legal. And you need to have that context. So in terms of um, those gaps and how best to do this data, and I've just got two more slides. I'm just watching the time here so I don't get carried away. Then these are what I listed. The main gaps for me is in the social data quantifiable empirical evidence. And that's why I shared with you the Bayesian belief networks. I've always said you could have the best science in the world, but it's perceptions that influences attitudes that influence behavior, whether people will support or not support rules and regulations um, and whether your management achieves the outcomes. Modeling socioeconomic changes, to show people local communities or fishers dependence on cetaceans over time. If you bring in a ban or a change and you put no transitional arrangement in place, people that don't have the opportunity for other jobs are not going to follow them. So it's important to understand that relationship between policy efficacy and management, but in that multi-level governance, local, national and international Transparency of data, those policy review cycle workshops, people share their information and it's agreed whether it's correct or not. And that gets that trust. It helps build a collaborative culture, inclusive community to get you sustainable outcomes. And then good governance incentivizes that effective engagement, as I said, not consultation, and allows you to work out what management measures will be supported when it's the right time and at what pace. And I did some work with the United Nations, and this is a free download, and it's a really nice um, governance toolkit. Um, I can share the link. I know it's very small, though, if people are interested. And then my very last slide, this busy, busy slide, 
when I was reflected, and I really enjoyed the sessions last week, those that I could make, well, I'm part of an ICES, International Council for Exploration of the Seas Working Group, and actually I gave, um, it was a European Commission group, a hard time saying, well, they didn't have social economics, so we set it up. And actually from this working group like this one, uh, we came up with this initial framework where we said, and as I say, although this is aquaculture, it could be cetaceans there. And we've, we wanted to come up with, so we identified social indicators as part of our socioeconomic, economic indicators that can be collected and used. And I've been working on the governance, on the systems thinking and how we can rethink that. But I just wanted to emphasize this framework that you need to get the indicators to show you're making progress. And we've been linking this with the um, sustainable development goals. Um, and so my conclusion or what I wanted to share that it's important to remember to do the multi-level governance, individual fisher, community, sector, national, regional, international, if you're going to get that effective cetacean science policy. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, I know I've tried to probably cover too much, but I really wanted to try and link some of the topics of the workshop that, that I listened to last week and um, hopefully give you a little bit of flavor of the experience um, I've had. So thank you very much. Thank you, Selina, uh, for your presentation. It has been very informative and I noted that it also introduced us into the social aspect as most of the presentation has been focusing in the economical aspect. And it's very interesting how you include social and economic aspect into this uh, multilateral governance framework or advancing the institutional frame framework to implement what we have di been discussing. Uh, we have some uh, we, I will give uh, some five minutes also for questions and comments to Selena's presentation. So if anyone wants to take the floor, please raise your hand. I think none. Is there someone? I am uh, asking for people that want to take the floor, if someone wants to make some questions. If not, I will move into next uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Martina Cuagliotto. Martina Cuagliotto is a lecturer in ecology and biological and environmental science at the University of Stirling. She worked on the ecological impact of carrion, mostly marine, on scavengers and soil, and the ecosystem service associated with it. She is here today to present about the past, present, and future of the ecosystem services provided by cetacean carcasses. Uh, Dr. Cuagliotto, thank you very much for being here and welcome. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Can you please tell me if you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Barbara, for uh, the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, uh, today uh, of the workshop. Thank you very, for, invi for inviting me as well. I would like to uh, present to you a work that we have published recently in the Journal of Ecosystem Services. This is, has been a, a work with a lot of people involved, multiple researchers from different institutions, so a lot of efforts. And I would like to thank everyone about our knowledge, especially um, my collaborators, Dr. Marcos Moleon from the University of Granada, uh, who came out with the idea uh, in the first place. So, so 
So the link between ecosystem services and cetaceans uh, has received uh, a lot of uh, attention lately. And uh, originally there was a lack of studies because of the drastic uh, decrease of uh, in whale numbers. So it was difficult actually to study their ecological role. But uh, nowadays we have uh, um, several papers discussing ecosystem services and cetaceans. So cetaceans are called uh, ecosystems engineers because of their role as consumers, but also prey and the role in, in creating the, what is called the whale pump and providing nutrients into the ocean. But as well, they have a huge cultural significance. So cetaceans are included in different uh, people traditions uh, are used for uh, tourism, ecotourism, and they have uh, uh, educational and aesthetical uh, value as well. And uh, carcasses are mentioned when explaining uh, the link between cetaceans and especially regulation and maintenance processes, such as storing carbon so when they die. So whale falls is when cetacean carcasses appear uh, when uh, uh, talking about ecosystem services, but uh, cetacean carcasses have uh, multiple uh, ecosystem services, and uh, we found uh, doubt uh, doing actually uh, this uh, study. So cetacean carcasses is uh, the uh, is the main topic of uh, the papers uh, and also it's uh, related ecosystem services uh, because they are providers of ecosystem service services, especially when uh, cetacean carcasses are in the shape of uh, strandings, uh, meaning that are uh, well beached uh, on a coastal area. So why cetacean carcasses are ecosystem services providers? First of all, I think that we identify this as a potential uh, gap of knowledge. And, uh, and so we started working on this. And the cetacean carcasses are a, natural, a naturally occurring element of the coast. If you think about that, 40% of the human population lives within 100 kilometers from the coast. So many coastal areas have been transformed. And the changes include urbanization, but also the application of policies urging the removal of carcasses. So there is a growing implementation of aseptic strategies in natural resource management. And this combined with the past depletion of the cetacean population, but also the existing regulation or removal of stranding carcasses, then we impose some uh, radical changes on, uh, on the abundance and also the availability of marine carrion on coastal areas, resulting eventually on the alterations of ecosystem services associated with the cetacean carcasses. So this is a, was a brief introduction of the reason why we, uh, we started working on this topic. And now I'm going to list you the aims of our study. First of all, uh, we wanted to identify past and present uh, ecosystem services provided by cetacean carcasses, especially strandings. And to do so, we run a literature review and we categorized uh, articles according to the ecosystem services type that they were dealing with, the cetacean groups or the family of cetacean, but also the study area and, uh, and the period that, uh, um, that uh, the ecosystem services were related to, such as prehistorical, historical, and modern, modern since the start of the 19th century. And then we wanted also to estimate the density of strandings because we wanted to analyze the association of uh, uh, stranding density with the human population density and regulation. And finally, we gathered an, um, a regulation um, and a whale carcass disposal methods from a different country. And this was uh, one of the topic of discussion uh, towards the end of our work. And to do so, we gathered the stranding data set from 19, 20, 29 countries and the regulation from 23 of them. And we built the maps and we uh, ran a statistical analysis um, to look at the association between human population density regulation and the density of strandings. 
So our literature review uh, led uh, to a final selection of uh, 27 articles dealing uh, with uh, ecosystem services provided by cetacean carcasses. We had uh, a higher uh, number of articles describing uh, provisioning services, uh, such as the use of meat and bones obtained by carcasses. You can see the first circle on the left of the artifacts in this slide. And uh, this is, was uh, followed by uh, cultural uh, supporting and regulated uh, services. Okay, so then we had a higher number of uh, articles uh, dealing with ecosystem services uh, uh, in modern times. And in standard, if you can see again in the artifacts, you can see that the provision in services actually they were related mostly to a prehistoric time. And in standard, going towards modern time, we develop more uh, articles uh, looking at the, the cultural meaning of the cetacean strandings. It's uh, interesting. The keyword human was included in more in more articles than uh, the word the keywords ecosystem service, and this reveals uh, that uh, despite uh, the literature acknowledges uh, the association between human cetacean carcasses or strandings, little of this association is still explained in terms of ecosystem services. So just uh, talking about uh, uh, provisioning services, uh, we can think about of a stranding such as a source of uh, food uh, or re uh, ready supply of bones uh, to be carved uh, into tools uh, as early as the Paleolithic. Uh, later civilizations also used uh, um, strandings for similar purposes. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, we know that uh, there are also other uh, populations such as Maori in New Zealand or the Fuegians, uh, the Kanoi people in, uh, in Patagonia, that uh, um, they regard uh, strandings as a great gift uh, from nature and uh, the old village would, would gather around this carcass appreciating uh, uh, the gift of uh, a huge amount of resources to be shared. And so you can see here in, uh, in the right side of the slide that um, there are combination of different cultural examples of cultural services, uh, including also uh, what is uh, the, what was the value um, of the cetacean carcasses towards the 18th century when uh, uh, carcasses and strandings were object of a scientific inquiry. So Latin names were given to these uh, sea creatures. And today as well are indicators of uh, ecosystem and population health. They've been proposed as, a, as a, you, you, you know, <laughs> but even better than me, as a sentinel species to enable researchers to monitor climate change. And of course, they, they contribute also to the nutrient cycling and carbon sequestration as in terms of waveforms. And of course, they, they can possibly also mitigate the global climate change. But also um, the supporting services of the cetacean carcasses, uh, meaning that uh, what is they also called the ecosystem functioning. So they have a huge uh, role uh, for uh, scavengers, and uh, they. Um, this uh, role uh, cover um, all the habitats and many creatures, both uh, obligate and facultative scavengers. Uh, so it's a very famous uh, the example of the whale falls uh, and the uh, different uh, successional stages that uh, a whale carcass go through in, in the deep sea. Um, but also uh, carcasses can be floating uh, on the surface uh, area of the sea and so attracting uh, both uh, avian scavengers uh, and uh, also uh, sharks. But uh, let's go back to the strandings. Carcass uh, eventually uh, could possibly strand on the, um, on the coast. And here again, another a wide variety of scavengers would gather on the carcass um, on the coastal area. And there are also examples uh, of, um, of the scavengers uh, um, gathering on the coast, uh, even if uh, they usually um, feed uh, inland. And there are examples also of a lot of scavengers that uh, can be uh, 
considered threatened on the point of view of the, their conservation status. And the strandings are very important for them. And we have a very clear scientific evidence, for example, for the Andean condors, that is a threatened species that has been hit quite hard by the historical lack of food resources on the coast for climatic reasons, but also during the whaling era. So that um, they had to um, rely on terrestrial feeding resources while having their nesting sites still on the coast because historically, historically they were using whale strandings. So you can see the importance of um, the supporting ecosystem services that uh, strandings can have on threatened and scavenging species. Then we look at the density of strandings. Uh, we had 20, um, 29, 26, sorry, 26 countries that they share their uh, stranding data set. And you can see that different countries have different challenges uh, depending on, uh, on the different um, number of strandings that, of course, uh, can be dependent also of the number of observations uh, that uh, have been made. And, um, and you can see that the uh, dolphin and porpoises were the most abundant group uh, found in the, in the, in the as a stranded carcasses. And, um, and this was expected uh, because of their small size. When we start instead, uh, analyzing the data and trying to find association of um, and stranding density uh, with the presence of management policies or human population density. And unfortunately, we, did, we didn't find that they were good predictors. And we, we actually recommend that the, uh, more, uh, more work should be done in these to understand better the distribution of, uh, of strandings. Uh, we, um, yes, we know that uh, this type of analysis was uh, quite uh, simple, but uh, it's a good start for then uh, preparing a new research on this topic. So the implementation of uh, uh, regulation for carcasses management is a recent and ongoing phenomenon. Out of 23 countries, uh, five uh, did not have uh, regulations. And why? For different reasons. Uh, is, uh, for example, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, they didn't have regulation because uh, they have uh, remote areas uh, with low human uh, population density. Uh, so was regulation were not required. And then also uh, sometimes there is no competent national authority uh, dealing with uh, strandings. The stakeholders involved in between the intervention and the carcass space, there are, there are a lot of them. And this is showing the complexity of, uh, uh, the complexity of uh, carcass disposal regulation and methods around the world. There is not just way, one way or one institution dealing for this. So they can be involved the local government, either the city council or the municipality or the land manager, the academic institution are often involved, um, the stranding network, NGOs, museum, and in the case also, for example, of New Zealand, also indigenous people are involved in the process because they, they do a proper uh, funeral to uh, the cetacean uh, carcasses. So um, there are uh, a huge, um, oh, not huge, so oh, there are also different methods of disposal across countries. And you can see these on the right, uh, listed according how frequently are used uh, by the countries that uh, participated into this uh, um, work. And uh, the most frequent methods of disposal is natural de decomposition in situ, followed by boreal, incineration plant, landfill, and then ocean toes. And then of course it's including also educational and scientific collection when vets come to collect the carcasses in order to study uh, the cause of death um, and uh, improve uh, our knowledge about uh, these animals as uh, ecosystem sentinels, but also other um, methods such as rendering a compound composting. If, when the removal was not compulsory, because there are some countries such as France and Belgium where the removal of a, a carcass is compulsory, but um, the, sometimes uh, there was an option 
uh, that the country could uh, decide, that the stakeholders involved could decide uh, that is uh, uh, context dependent. For example, often if a cetacean carcass was found on a remote beach, uh, uh, that uh, would have been left uh, in situ for a natural decomposition. Instead, if it's found on a touristic area, then instead it would be uh, removed. So uh, what I would like to say here is that, that uh, study cetacean carcass management, uh, we think that is an increase in global matters for different reasons, because uh, Coastal areas become more populated because possibly new regulations are going to be approved, but also because the cetacean population are recovering. And that is something that I heard in a previous uh, um, session of this uh, of this uh, workshop. Uh, if the uh, cetacean population are recovering, it's possible that uh, the number of uh, natural strandings uh, occur in our coastal areas are also increasing. And so because uh, this is an important matter. Uh, we need to start uh, weighing, weighing uh, different factors uh, around the stranding carcasses and their management, uh, including the costs of uh, management action, and uh, but also the legal and, uh, and public health requirement. Of course, we are not recommending to leave every carcass on the coast. We want uh, the health and safety of people first. But as well, we needed to consider their ecological importance. We gave, I gave a quite a, a good example of uh, the importance for certain scavenging species that these marine carrion resources have, but also the list of uh, the multiple uh, ecosystem services that they provide and uh, the, um, the support to biodiversity conservation as well. So uh, our finally uh, recommendation, what uh, we, we would like to say is uh, try to maximize the benefits uh, of the cetacean carcasses by identifying those uh, methods of disposal that uh, mostly that prefer preserve and enhance the most the ecosystem function and services. And so now you can see in this table uh, um, on the right side, we um, linked to each method of disposal if uh, they, um, uh, they support uh, certain ecosystem services or not, and uh, if there are costs involved. So when, uh, uh, for example, left in situ, a cetacean carcass can provide uh, all the type of ecosystem services with very low management uh, cost, but uh, the social malcontent may rise. So, but still, uh, uh, this is our um, recommended uh, option. And then burial is also cost effective, but uh, the nutrient enrichment might contaminate, for example, the groundwater and attract sharks, and these would be affected touristic areas, for example. Tow is also a good option, but then um, it can become also a maritime hazard. So there are uh, different pros and cons that we need to consider in order to enhance the ecosystem services of, uh, of cetacean carcasses. Because, for example, when we move the carcass, uh, transports, uh, logistics, uh, and therefore costs are involved. And so uh, not only costs are involved, but the, uh, the decrease in ecosystem services uh, as well. Incineration is uh, uh, the more, most expensive um, um, methods that we found out and uh, also involved uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not very much recommended. So um, just... Uh, we recommend also that the management may be season or location dependent. So again, uh, during the tourist uh, uh, touristic uh, season, maybe I remove the carcass uh, in a remote area with less with tourism or remove it completely. Location dependence always uh, talking about uh, uh, touristic and remote beach as well. So uh, we try to uh, leave as much as we can uh, uh, carcasses that uh, are found in remote beaches, but also thinking about the size and number of carcasses. Small carcasses possibly that are 
logistically less, uh, you need the logistically less efforts for moving them around. And, uh, and so that maybe can be the first uh, um, way to move uh, small carcasses from a three stick to a more remote beach. And if it's instead a large whale, maybe can be chopped up so that uh, the composition, but also the uh, scavenger consumption can be uh, happening much more quickly. So there are many things to take in consideration, but what we recommend for the future as well is like implement innovative science and outreach via citizen science and education. So we want to increase the public awareness of the ecological and cultural role of cetacean strandings. And finally, as the topic of main topic of this. Um, workshop uh, would be nice uh, to enhance uh, um, the knowledge uh, about uh, use and non-use values of cetacean carcasses and trying to estimate them uh, in different uh, contexts uh, and also integrating market and monetary evaluation to the ecosystem services that uh, they provide. And with this last slide, I wanted to thank you for your attention and I would be happy to discuss it further if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, very much for your interesting presentation to give us the example on the carcasses that yeah, has no. been one of the issues addressed by the scientific committee and it has so many different ecosystem services. I will now give the floor for a comment and question and I have uh, two uh, raised hands. Uh, Isabel and Marcello. Uh, please, uh, Isabel, go, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Martina. A very nice talk. I, I have a doubt. I, I, I am wondering why you relate or you, you wanted to relate the strandings to uh, human density. And uh, because I think that maybe is more related uh, to the currents, uh, to the uh, to the geographic uh, of the of the sites, and also more uh, more related to the species, no? Because I don't know if you you find any difference between the species, because odontocetes uh, are more um, tend tend uh, uh, the tendency is that the strand in more numbers than than the the misty seeds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. No. Thank you. I completely agree. We are uh, uh, we acknowledge in our paper that these were uh, very uh, preliminary um, preliminary analyses. Uh, also, the fact that uh, um, these data set has been shared from many different countries, and so we didn't have the level of. Uh, um, of details of the data to use for uh, more important analyses. So. Definitely, I agree with you, Isabel, that uh, there are many other factors to take in consideration and we didn't do in this paper. So uh, we wanted just to give a, 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 an initial idea of why uh, we, uh, we find more strandings if there is a, um, yeah, like there is a, a relationship uh, so that we can understand also if more populated areas, they have, uh, more observer on the coast and therefore this is why we uh, find more carcasses because there is this big um, observation uh, bias right depending on and depending also the institution working the, the stranding network working in uh, categorizing uh, uh, collecting this data i hope that i answer your question thank you thank you Thank you uh, for your question, Isabel, and for your reply, Martina. I will now give the floor to Marcello. Marcello, please. Thank you, Barbara, and, and thank you, Martina, for such a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh -huh. um, I have two real quick questions. So um, first, I was wondering, uh, because this is something that I wonder if you had had a discussion with, with your team on how appropriate it was to apply the ecosystem services approach 
to a unit of analysis that is not an ecosystem, right? It's a species. So how adaptable is that approach to species? Uh, for example, if we, if we speak about meat from tuna, we don't say that that's an ecosystem services from tuna, it's, it's it from the ocean. Uh, but, but I mean, I, I really have this question because on other ecosystems, we really speak about specific species like in pollination, for example. And, and, and the second one is if you consider, um, and I, I don't know if you mentioned it really briefly, ecosystem uh, disservices. Mm -hmm. um, for example, how a huge carcass can impact the health of the community or a tourism in a beach, right? Um, and this could be linked also with, if we have more populated areas, then which would be higher if ecosystem services or these services due to these different impacts on the well-being of, of the communities. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcelo. Uh, Marcelo, for your for your question. So about the the, the species uh, the species ecosystem services uh, that you were asking first. Uh, so I believe that. Uh, we discuss a lot about cetacean ecosystem services, uh, right? That are related to this group, group, big group of animals. So I, uh, this is why uh, we thought that to um, to work on uh, on cetacean strandings ecosystem services. If I if I answer your question, it seems quite. Um, simple maybe reasoning but also because we found this uh, big gap of knowledge because there is a lot of a lot of discussion about ecosystem services from uh, obtained from living organisms and living species and uh, because the group of people that we are working on we are scavengers ecologists and carrion ecologists so this is possibly where it comes from uh, this uh, very focused uh, um, uh, point of view and uh, we we really are uh, advocates of the importance of carrying in and ecosystems, any kind of ecosystems. And we thought that, that uh, as also Celine, uh, Celine said before, in terrestrial environment and ecosystems, uh, they are, the knowledge on them is so much developed instead of the marine one is not, uh, is not as much in terms of ecosystem services. And therefore we thought that uh, was a great venue to, to discuss uh, services uh, providing by, by um, strandings. Uh, I think that uh, um, scavengers are a part of the ecosystem, the ecosystem that sometimes are not acknowledged. Um, scavengers, uh, they maintain our ecosystem healthy removing the carcasses, they remove uh, the disease that these carcasses can spread. And of course they have uh, also um, um, an intrinsic value as a part of the biodiversity. So this is, I think that all these different uh, factors that I just explained are the reason why we wanted to talk about uh, ecosystem services related to cetacean carcasses. And going back uh, to your second uh, question, is super pertinent <laughs> about the, the services. This is, uh, uh, is an ongoing uh, discussion. Uh, we deliberately, um, deliberately uh, discuss uh, services rather than these services uh, in uh, these uh, papers, but uh, uh, we are very open to talk about these services. As I said during my talk, we are not um, we are not recommending that uh, any carcass uh, um, that uh, reach the coast uh, should be left there. We are completely um, aware of the health and safety risk that uh, they can have, and therefore this is a, a, a very important point of discussion. So when can we actually? Uh, leave carcasses in situ without uh, um, creating health and, and risk uh, problems uh, to uh, people living there. So it's about, uh, I think that there is no one way to do things. I think that we need to, um, for every, like uh, making some decision for uh, uh, each context uh, where we are.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Thank Martina. you. Thank you, Martina, for your question. Is there any other comments or question to Martina's presentation? It seems no. So I have one. And I, I have uh, one observation or comment because the example of the Caracas is very, um, very illustrative of what we are dealing here, trying to associate some ecosystem services to cetaceans, biological research we already know which might be more difficult when we talk about whale pump to understand or convene your belt. Uh, the carcasses, and my point was, you talk about the ecosystem services of the carcasses and one of the ecosystem, uh, the, the ecosystem functioning that is uh, uh, more deeply related to carcasses, whale carcasses has been the absorption of uh, CO2 of carbon sequestration because of the, uh, particularly for waste of the huge mass that goes into the deep sea and then a, they store or they capture or sequester the carbon at deep seas. But then when you have the stranding of the carcass, what about the CO2? It is released into the atmosphere. So then the ecosystem services provided is, is different. Also, I, I, I might be considering that the scavenger's organism will be different a deep sea or in coastal water. So this makes a valuation, like different type of valuation, either if it's the carcass at deep sea or at the coast, Might, maybe from a social economical perspective, and uh, considering the numbers of whales that die unstranded or, or dolphins would not be considerably significant related to uh, the others, but until you do the math, you will never be really, really sure about that. Just a guess. Yeah, so what, what do you think about this uh, different approach for the same well ecosystems yeah, functioning approach? That, first of all, as you mentioned, it's very difficult to understand uh, what, what are, what is the, the proportion of strandings, uh, no, sorry, the proportion of cetaceans uh, Carcass is falling in the deep sea, and uh, we understand the, uh, the proportion uh, going uh, into the coast. So, definitely, on the point of view of uh, regulating um, ecosystem services, way falls uh, for the storage of carbon in the deep sea it, it is a much more, um, yeah. It, it, yeah, definitely they, they are much better in this type of ecosystem services rather than the strandings. But the, the strandings, uh, um, the option that you have, okay, maybe there can be a CO2 release on the, uh, on the atmosphere, but what about the huge biomass that provides to the ecosystem in, in terms of like a scavenging consumption, consumption? And what about if I have to, if we need to compare um, the, um, the, the carcass left in situ and then fed by scavengers and providing nutrients to the ecosystem in comparison and providing also possibly CO2 in comparison to the situation on one has been incinerated in a, in a incineratory plant. So that one is like a um, greenhouse release uh, on purpose, uh, in missing many other ecosystem services related. So um, I I think another option is uh, possibly um, you know, composting or rendering uh, composting uh, to get the nutrients uh, for the for the soil, for example. And rendering means uh, transforming um, such a biomass in another type of food that uh, can be used for um, you know for, for other pets or. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not an expert on rendering oxidation carcasses. But you know, I think that uh, yes, your point uh, is very true, and uh, I am uh, with you. At the same time, I don't think that it would justify the fact that uh, uh, there is a reason to send them uh, to the incinerator uh, plant. Uh, in my opinion, of course. 
I hope that I answer your question, Barbara. Thank you. Yes, it was like an open discussion because this is a very uh, different point on how to evaluate a carcasses, either in, at sea or at the coast. And certainly I, I agree with you that incineration is not really the best eco environmental or, or ecological also way forward. Also you, you transport the carcass uh, through truck uh, and camion, you're still uh, releasing CO2 also in that moment, uh, not only when uh, you, <laughs> you incinerate the carcass. So I, yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot to discuss if you want. Yes, thank you very much, Martina, for your presentation. And it is uh, already almost 4.10. I will give now a 20 minute break and we can reconvene at 4.30 uh, from uh, UK time in 20 more minutes. And then we will come back to hear the report from the small working group that was uh, uh, discussing how to move forward with the uh, table that we were advancing and suggest some uh, work how to start with the open discussion on the last agenda items that are uh, need to be uh, developed today on the uh, list of recommendation and potential approach for the next for the commission to bring to the commission in uh, their next plenary meeting and to the conservation committee. So thank you and we reconvene in 20 more minutes.
também. Hello, everybody. It's already uh, four thirteen and UK time, and I would like to come back to our sessions for the last one hour and a half of this workshop, the last session of the workshop, to finalize the discussions and move forward with recommendations to bring to the Commission. Um, last uh, session, there was a small working group that was created to further review, go through uh, the scientific committee table on cetaceans, threats, and the related ecosystem functions. And this small working group had a virtual meeting last Friday where there was some advances made and also some uh, topic ideas for moving forward with the recommendation as a starting point for our next discussion. So I would kindly ask uh, Marcello that uh, Hernandez Blanco, that volunteer to introduce uh, the report of this small working group. Thank Marcello, you thank uh, you very much for helping us with this over these sessions. No, thank, thank you all. Thank you and to all the, the members and for the members of the subgroup that we 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 had that meeting uh, last last Friday. I think it was very useful. I don't know if you want me to go through through the notes or do you want me to explain the new tables and share it as well? Should I share the 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 table as it is right now? Yes, please. If you want to uh, explain the tables first and then move into the and the rationale behind the table and then uh, move towards. Uh, the notes of the discussion. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and please let me know if if I forget something, which I'm gonna forget something because um, you know we we had so much so many useful uh, comments from the different uh, people who participated in this call. So please 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 let me know if I'm forgetting anything. Um, so this let me. Share this screen. You, you can see my screen right now, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, what what we did was, and um, I don't know if uh, the majority of you remember the the first or well, the original table that was presented on the the first two days of the workshop. Um, it was a sort of a linear analysis of which traits. Uh, become or are or has an effect or an impact or play a role in ecosystem functions and how those functions uh, become ecosystem services. That was sort of the linear logic that we were following on, on, on the original you know table. And, um, and and one goal that we have to have in mind is why are we doing this right because we also thought or spoke about once we have those ecosystem services identified then which methods we could use to value those those uh, those services right so and, and so that makes more columns and that it's part of that that linear way of of how we are envisioning the end goal of, of doing this analysis, right? So uh, I think one first big and overall question is what's what's our uh, overarching goal uh, with with this, right? Um, at the end, what do we want to 
achieve by assigning values to these services and functions, right? Uh, so I think that's that's key for for all the for both the conservation and the scientific committee uh, to see if what we want is to develop a financial mechanism around these services, new governance structures as, as the one that were presented uh, today and as the one that Bob and I spoke uh, last Friday, et cetera, right? So that that's really key to understand because otherwise we could end up having these uh, huge numbers of the values of these services, but then we don't know what to do with it. But anyway, um, like I was, as I was looking at the, the original table, I thought that the, 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 the research question that that table addressed was how each ecosystem function uh, be, can be translated into an individual ecosystem services, right? So we had that list of, of functions the majority were uh, nutrient cycling, habitat uh, provision. We, I think we have uh, gene, uh, yeah, genes, gene pool maintenance, et cetera. So all those functions, how can they be translated into uh, services? But I think we, we could transform that question. And, and I, I guess this is open, not guess, of course, this is open for, for discussion is instead of having that linear vision of how each one of these functions translate to uh, ecosystems perhaps would be better to ask ourselves which of these ecosystem functions that were identified by the scientific committee can be translated into ecosystem services due to the existence of someone that gets a benefit from it right so let's let's see which of these really have a beneficiary and if there's a beneficiary for this function then there would be a service. And then the uh, what do we do with the other ones, right? So from the remaining ecosystem functions that are not services, we could consider them group as a bundle approach or, a, or individual. So which of these could be uh, supporting functions or services to the ocean health, right? Um, and I think here is, Perhaps one of the main uh, questions for, for the workshop is how ecosystem functions from cetaceans, such as the ones that I was mentioning, nutrient cycling, support the productivity of a sector. And of course, an obvious one is fisheries, right? Uh, and, and I think this, this to answer this question, we would require uh, so much more analysis and we could even write a paper or build a model. I know there's a modeling team. We could do both, or we should do both. And, and please count of me uh, for for any of these, um, because this is very similar. For example, if we analyze the health of of soils, for example, right, the, the health of the soil depends on microorganisms such as worms and uh, and and fungi, right? So those organisms do not provide a service per se, but are the supporting functions or services that at the end makes a, 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 a soil healthy that provides food, right? And uh, if you like more a marine example, for example, it would be the same thing with parrot fish, right? The parrot fish um, don't provide a, a direct ecosystem service, but for example, it, as you all know, provides much of the sand in some beaches or maintain coral reefs clean uh, from algae, for example. So the coral reef can provide uh, those services. So um, that's what is uh, represented in these uh, diagrams uh, from, from the, the first one is from Bob Custance's paper of I think 99, uh, 2017. I can give you the reference later. And I think uh, this is how divided the, the table, table one was divided in three tables. Uh, table V are those functions that are not translated in, that we think are not translated into services because they don't have a direct or indirect beneficiary, but are functions that supports uh, ocean health somehow, right? And, and tables one and Z addresses uh, if what, 
uh, what we had as a as a function really becomes a service or it could be that those are not example of, of service at all. Um, and, and another key point I think we, we should consider is uh, the scope, right? And uh, the, the recommendation was that for a first exercise uh, to fill this, this table, which can get really complex, complicated, it's to focus first on one species. Um, I think uh, a, a proposal for this was the Northern right whale. So the analysis goes through one, just to one specific species instead of mixing many, many different functions that might not be shared throughout all the, the species, right? So that, that's uh, important. So table 1A, um, we identified that out of all of those uh, functions that we had in the original table, we end up having that these two functions translated into a service, which is climate regulation. And, and we had some presentations about this, for example, from, from Ralph, from the IMF, and how if, if we already, even if we have only one service like climate regulation, this gives you, give us so much space to analyze the different methods that we could use for, you know, for, for valuing this service and what mechanisms can be put in place being financial or, or institutional to help you know, conserve and restore these populations of these species in particular, using their role as climate regulators um, as a justification for the investment that would be needed to, to protect them, right? So that's the whole chain of logic on why we uh, you know, uh, use the ecosystem services approach. Table B, um, 1B, right? Remember that this was one single uh, table that we divided in three, A, B, and Z. Table B are the functions that we think cannot easily be translated into a service. So I think, and this is, uh, goes back to the question that I was proposing we should have as part of the workshop is how these serve uh, how these functions what we used to call supporting services support or are the base of another service or even economic sector uh, where features again is uh, an obvious I think one that we should consider right so what's what's the role what would happen if we lose these animals, so what would happen if we increase the population of these animals? How they, as ecosystem engineers, could make these other sectors increase their productivity and hence increase human well being, right? So at the end, humans would be depending on whales to support these uh, economic sectors. And, and in my opinion, and I could be totally wrong. I think that that should be a question that we uh, should address more and could be part of the, the heart of, of the, the questions that we want to address right now in the workshop and in the following analysis that we want to develop as, as a, as a follow-up of the workshop. And um, then table C is those uh, services that were categorized as services, but that in reality are not services. For example, ecosystem resilience and stability. And, and I think this, this one in particular could relate to the, the functions because if you have functions and, um, and, and the structure, right? Uh, or the traits which provide those functions is part of what gives the ecosystem um, uh, the, re the, re the resilience, but it's not part of, of the service, right? It's, is a property of the health of the ecosystem, but not necessarily is a service, right? So for, we, we had other examples, uh, for example, the praise dispersed as one at sea and colonies, that, that's not exactly a service. But it could also be a matter of how we, it was written or how it was described if perhaps if we change the, how it was written, perhaps it could become a, a function, et cetera. But uh, so overall, this was how we envisioned that we could split the, the table in order to have a more, yeah, clear 
point of view on, on how to address the, the question of, of ecosystem uh, functions and, and services from cetaceans. I don't know if, well, that, that has been a tons of, of information, Barbara. I don't know if, if we wanna make a pause here and have some impressions or, or comments or. I, I, I would rather go with the entire report of the session because we are 15 minutes only left for the workshop. So if you could introduce the conclusions and then we come back to address all together. Sure, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and uh, just gonna go through really quick to the to the report that was written by by the this small sorry, group, uh, sorry, Mar Marcella, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was confused. We are no. we have one hour and a fifteen minutes, so it's okay. I was <laughs> nervous about the fifteen minutes to address everything. So, yes, please have a break here because it's very complicated table, and the rationale behind was very uh, illustrative for for us to enlighten how to move it. So, I will give the floor. For, for questions and comments on the table, because it's important uh, to, to try to add into what has been discussed by, by the small working group. I'm sorry, <laughs> time difference, Howard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is, it could be a great time if, if uh, the members of the workshop have some comments, or feedback, if, if it makes sense, uh, please let us know. Yes, I, I want to uh, encourage the, the participants uh, to make comments on this table. And if you agree on the approach, this has been an exercise that not all of us has done. Marcello did a very thorough review to the scientific committee table. And what I would like to point out is that from the more than 30 plus threats that the scientific committee identified and associated an ecosystem function, this has been reduced to only table 1A, two major threats, cetacean threats, to be used under a framework for socioeconomic valuation. And the rest would need much more complex model or are not even included yet into any valuation on, on this topic. So I will give the floor to uh, questions, comments, or what are your suggestions? Or if you are ag agree with the suggestions, uh, fine, but there's a small working group to split the table on through and then go to fill it with the, the one species example which was the proposed way forward. And um, of course, not necessarily we will agree on the contents of 1A, 1B, 1C has some others might believe there are some functions that could be directly translated in, into ecosystem services. So please, I give the floor to everybody that want to contribute to this discussion. Thank you. Barbara, I just for, forgot to say that um, we had included other services here, but that weren't the, you know, the, they weren't part of the scope of the workshop, right? So uh, if we, if we want to include other services, these other services could help being such a, like an umbrella services to justify the protection of the other functions, right? But um from, uh, from the terms or reference of the workshop and the work that we should be doing, I understand that, that we're not going to, right now at least, not going to uh, 
assess these other services, which the majority are cultural services that we are not considering here. And the focus would be more the, the, the functions that are more related to specifically to, to, uh, to regulating services and some provisioning services. And, and regarding table C, it's it's a matter of if if the group uh, agrees, it's it's a matter of deleting those from from the original table, right? So we only would have to fill table one A and B. And again, I, I think table B would be one of of of, of the key, you know, uh, yeah, our, our would be our core work. Thank you, Marcello. I have uh, Astrid Foot. Yeah, sorry, and um, <clears throat> uh, I hope this makes sense, but just looking at table 1A, I think that the, probably there would need to be a, a few more in there, just uh, for example, to just uh, put climate regulation as a, a, an ecosystem service, which is probably one of the most important. But I think, for example, primary productivity and enhancing that should be in there as well. I, I know it's, you know, in, in the thinking, of course, uh, as Marcello just explained, but <clears throat> maybe it's important to just break it down further. Um, and also, you know, the whole thing of the uh, Great Whale Conveyor Belt. So the fact of, you know, how whales migrate and uh, distribute um, uh, <clears throat> um, nutrients through the oceans from, you know, their feeding grounds to their breeding grounds and all that. So I think just um, preempting it to, to just be about um, this one major ecosystem service of climate regulation seems a bit uh, very much on the point. Um, and maybe it's, it's important to just break it down a little bit further. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not a marine biologist, so I'm more speaking from the angle of someone who will lobby for, for this whole thing with stakeholders and trying to translate it to political uh, and other policy um, uh, decision makers. So it's probably just having this one uh, big ecosystem service in the first table is probably not enough from my point of view, but I'm not sure if this makes sense. So please others jump in if, if this did make sense at all. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense, Astrid. And uh, just to remind that we only took the ones that were already in, in, in the table. And, uh, and, and the, how we separated this is that if there exists a beneficiary of that, of that function uh, regarding uh, productivity, that's a function or part of what we used to call in the natural capital you know, assessments. Those are supporting uh, services. So prima, uh, primary productivity, for example, in a, a mangrove leads to have a higher uh, carbon sequestration, for example, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's that, you know, that, that change of process of where a function fits or where a, a, a section, a, a service fits, right? So primary productivity, it's key here. And we see it in nutrient cycling, for example, but that comes before a, a service. And uh, so um, you, you're totally right, but it, 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 we have to be mindful or, of specifically if how to translate into a service, uh, exactly. That's like a really good primate point. Primate productivity, yeah. like primate productivity, if whales, you know, enhances primate productivity, that at the end, it's gonna enhance Fisher, fisheries, for example, right? So that's the end, at, at the end, the ecosystem service, the provision of food through fisheries provided by a function from a cetacean, right? So uh, that's part of the whole systemic approach that we need to consider here. And it's also part of the problem, not a part of the problem, but part of the challenge of using in, a, an approach that was designed for ecosystems and applied for a, for a species or a, a specifically, right? 
like ecosystem services uh, uh, are for a coral reef, a mangrove, the ocean, a forest, a seagrass. Um, but now we, we want to apply it for, for a specific species. So that, that could be part of what we call, we could get lost in translation between approaches be, because those difference. Thank you, Astrid and Marcello for the question. We have uh, two more uh, comments. Lorenzo and then DJ, uh, please, Lorenzo, welcome. Thanks, Barbara, and again, thanks for the speakers today. That's been really very, very interesting for all of us. Uh, one of the, I think that least to me, one of the more important part of this uh, workshop that I opening is exactly ecosystem services. What is an ecosystem service? I realize now it's more complex than I, thought before the workshop and certainly the report has to be very clear on what we, or at least in the workshop, we understood as ecosystem services. So thanks for all the speakers for making this more clear to everybody. I'm not so sure I could choose exactly what ecosystem service is right now. And because of that, going through the table so quick, it's hard really to digest everything we've gone, uh, I mean, the last two days and, and today. So uh, we might need more time to look at the table and, 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 and see if there is anything we can say more about it, but uh, I doubt it. I like the approach of dividing. I think this is, to me, one of the most important parts of the workshop, taking what the scientific committee and then being able to filter what we really need and where, how we can progress, because certainly this is not going to be the only workshop on this uh, on ecosystem services, so at least I hope it will not be. And this comes also to the first talk today, how to bring the social and economic part that I've been saying as chair of the conservation committee, we need to put this social and economic part into the conservation committee. That's something we've been missing and I had some questions about that, but I will not do it today. My doubt was at least if I understood correctly, uh, and I like the approach first uh, to use one species and, and see how we progress with that. My only concern is which species are we choosing? I thought you say right whales, and I was thinking of, we have some bocas paper and other papers that have more info on other whales than on right whales. So I might misunderstood what the species example, I don't want to discuss it, but I think we have to consider what do we have and which species might be best to do this exercise. Probably you did already and I didn't notice that, but thanks very much again. And thanks Barbara, you're doing an excellent job. Thank you, Lorenzo. I wonder if Marcello want to answer Lorenzo? Yes. Yes, well, okay. just one uh, quick comment here. Uh, ecosystem services are the benefits society or humans get from nature, right? So that's that's why we need that human part. How how do we really are getting something from from nature? It's a totally anthropogenic, uh, anthropocentric point of view, which again is not the only one that we need to take in consideration when we make decisions, right? So so that's the easier and shortest definition. And and regarding the northern right, where well, was a suggestion from some of the colleagues in the small group. Uh, but it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a, a proposal uh, perhaps, and, and I don't know if Lorenzo was also suggesting this and making it more you know, scientifically bureaucratic, we, we could uh, develop some criteria to choose that species, uh, which I think it, it would be also useful and it would help make a consensus between uh, the, the, the evaluators of, of this table. Can I respond a little to that? Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, thanks Marcello, this is helpful. And I understand that concept of, and I think we all understand that concept of ecosystem services, but once you get into the details of everything, and it was like Astrid's question just a few minutes ago, you have about climate change or, uh, and then you have primary productivity for many, 
before the workshop, primary productivity sounded as an ecosystem service. And as you say, this is not exactly the ecosystem service. So I, meaning we have those things, we can understand the big concept, but once you get into the details of what is an ecosystem services, we might change our minds or or understand better. So that's uh, that's important. Yeah, uh, regarding the species, if, I mean, might be good to have the like, criteria, as you say, and, and see which species might fit the bill better to progress. I trust you had a good discussion, but anyway, I just wanted to bring up that we might have more info on other species than the right whale at least recent uh, recent uh, papers on, on other species. Thanks. Thank you, Lorenzo. And uh, now we have a DJ that has raised their hand and also Javier Rodriguez has raised their hand again. So I will give the floor to DJ. Yeah, thank, thank you, Barbara. I would just... Um... On the couple of issues that have been raised, um, as Marcelo indicated, the North Atlantic right whale was just a suggestion. I completely understand what uh, Lorenzo is suggesting. We could go back and look at the literature by Saboka, Roman, and others to find out if there are uh, other whale species for which we have more data that might be a better um, species to use, uh, you know, to create sort of a species specific example. So that's very achievable. Um, the other thing I wanted to note, and this gets back to, I think another comment made by Lorenzo, uh, suggesting that uh, there's so much in this table or these tables that uh, more time is necessary. One of the things that we did discuss in the small working group is the possibility of extending the small working group and adding members, ideally uh, some, some cetacean biologists, uh, perhaps another economist or two, so that we have a, a larger small working group, larger than what was what was uh, what we had on Friday, but a still manageable working group to really work through the table and to fill in as many of the cells as, as we can in all three tables. And if necessary to amend table 1A to add more, um, add more information if we think it's relevant. In regards to table 1A, I just wanted to note that there are currently two rows of information. Um, there are two ways, of course, as we all know, that whales can sequester carbon, both living whales and when they die and their carcasses um, sink to the seafloor. And, and perhaps that's all captured in the body mass trait, but we might wanna add a row regarding you know, specifically about whale falls because that is also part of climate regulation. In regards to Astrid's comment, I completely understand where she's coming from. That was my initial reaction as well. I agree with Marcelo that you know, the, the role of cetaceans and, and, and nutrient transport, nutrient transfer, it, it, it the, the, the understanding is that it benefits primary productivity, you know, increasing phytoplankton abundance blooms, and that contributes to the entire marine food web. I, I think, and, and I'm no economist, but I, I think from an economist perspective, uh, what's difficult about that issue is I'm not sure the scientists know enough yet in terms of what amount of how, how much higher is the productivity as a result of the role of, of whales in nutrient transfer than it would be without the whales. And I might be wrong, and there are certainly cetacean scientists on the call that might be able to correct me, but you know, perhaps the scientists need to better understand that before the economists can take that data and try to um, put a value on it. Thank you. Thank you, DJ, for your points and uh, suggestions. I think that was uh, pretty much what has been also discussed with the small working group. So th thanks for bringing this up too. And Barbara? Yes, Marcello? No, just to follow up of DJ's comments, that, that's key, you know, because when, when we speak about economic valuation of services, sometimes it sounds really simple. And then that's why we need so many uh, 
different disciplines in in this assessment. So um, that part of the biophysical assessment and, and that bi uh, that knowledge gap on 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 those biophysical traits or characteristics or process, if they had not been assessed, then we cannot proceed to the to the rest of, of the analysis. So perhaps even a an, a, a, a a good uh, agreement, I mean an important agreement and, and, and a step to follow up after the workshop would be to to do this work on on, on a review on what exactly what what's what's what we have in order to move to the economic analysis to that I don't know like again a literature review on how much we exactly know or can we quantify in terms of those functions in order to proceed with the with the uh, evaluation so that that's a knowledge gap that we could address and it would be super valuable. Yes, uh, th thank you, Marcello. This, for all the participants to know, it's a living document, the tables. And it's uh, pretty clear now after all these three sessions of discussion that we have much more citation threads and uh, research, scientific research gaps that uh, the scientific committee is uh, looking at and a fewer of all these long lists can be easily translated to the socioeconomic uh, aspect. So we will, with this uh, uh, work we are doing and the future work, we'll probably come up with a more research gap from a socioeconomic perspective and modeling on socioeconomic terms. But this is a very good starting point I will give now the floor to uh, Javier. Thanks, Barbara, and thank you, Marcello, also. Um, I think that in the context of this late discussion, uh, it will be important to consider that uh, when we talk about um, the ecosystem service of certain species or group of species, uh, there's a, a general bef benefit for um, for the organism in, in that ecosystem. But when we talk about humans, there are, there are additional ecosystem services that, uh, that are for the benefit of, uh, of us as a species and that are not uh, um, useful for other species. So I think that uh, for both the considerations in general and for the evaluation, of such ecosystem services, it's important to make this difference uh, and, and also evaluate them separately. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Javier. If I understood your point was that it's the ecosystem functions the ecosystem services for humans not necessarily benefit other species and the other way around also the general benefits sometimes uh, other species and not necessarily the human beings and that we should consider uh, both directions. It Was that your point? Uh, Javier, I think yes. you're on mute. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it's part of my point in the terms that um, we, we need at last to make a balance, a proper balance uh, of which are ecosystem services that are for our benefit, but not affect the rest of the ecosystem and which of these ecosystem services we, we take advantage can be uh, a problem for the ecosystem. So we have to evaluate them separately and make a balance at last. Well, I think Barbara, I, 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 Well, I don't know if, I, hi, Javier, como estas? Uh, one, one thing that, that we need to be clear is that if, if we're gonna speak about services, 
then we're strictly speaking about how the human component, right? Uh, if, if we want to assess what's the, the role of whales in providing, uh, you know, uh, part of, of, of the role of, of whales in, in the health of the ocean and how interrelates with, with the health of other uh, populations or other species. That's a, a different question that at the end, it's part of the function of the ecosystem and the role of these specific engineers. But if we're speaking about services, then we have to strictly assess the benefits to humans. And, and that's why we had another column that is how are we going to evaluate or, or economically evaluate these. And these tools are, have, been, have been designed to evaluate benefits to, to humans. Both Thank you, Marcella. Thank you, Marcello, for the clarification. So I am uh, uh, will ask if someone has more uh, comments to make to the table. Please raise your hand. It seems known. S just to make summarize. What would or have been suggested as next step, and if you agree with that, is to create this small working group to add additional persons uh, to review the table. And we will need some scientists, of course, and some uh, social scientists and economists to support that because it's a very a complex analysis to do. And this will be just uh, an exercise uh, to append as an uh, annex to the report. But if we decide to move in the next steps to make an exercise focused on one species, then this uh, table and whatever has been uh, discussed and agree on that would be um, an input for and a starting point for that uh, work. So I would ask the participants if or if they agree with the proposed uh, way forward to advance on this table. There is also an option to forward this table to other economists, biologists, and try to do the same exercise of splitting the table in three to uh, understand the level of agreement be between the different visions because I'm sure, and we already experienced that, uh, that some people might believe some of these uh, functions from cetaceans um, can be providing other ecosystem services like the, or indirect or direct to the, to the system. So these are the two options. Perhaps the small working group can also decide on the on sending this like a questionnaire to, and ask uh, this uh, expert to make the same exercises to see how is the uh, agreement among different researchers. Um, the creation of the small working group also I would request. If everybody agrees or anyone has a different view or suggestion that we could uh, adopt. No, so I think we will request now who would like to be or if you know someone that we should approach 
to invite to work on this uh, small working group intersectionally before the uh, adoption of the, the, the report, this workshop report. I have a message from uh, Instituto de Conservación de Ballenas that want to add some uh, biologists to this group. So Macarena Agrelo, so we will consider her just has she's a modeler from scientist and modeler dj do you have your hands raised uh, i'm already on the small working group but i just want to make sure i continue to be on this newly constituted small working group so thank you thank you dj yes i i guess the people on the small working group already will continue Okay, so I, unless you want to uh, not be included, just let us know the small working group that is uh, already there. So Astrid? Yeah, just happy to join as well, if there's not already too, too much of a crowd. Okay, thank you very much, Astrid. Okay, so if... Javier? I also would like to be included. Perfect, Javier. And Thank you. Is there anyone else? And if you consider someone that need or is appropriated to join the group, so please let us know and we can send them an invitation. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you very much, everybody, for your comments. We will proceed with the small working group to check at this table to be included and try to fill it as much as possible. And it will be uh, an access to the uh, workshop report. And the workshop report, of course, will be circulated among the participants for comments. So I will give uh, the floor back to Marcello, if he can uh, continue to summarize after making all this table presentation, which is very important work that we have uh, advanced, to continue with the discussion to show the summary of the discussions on, uh, last Friday. Thank you, Marcello. I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. I was just saying that let me let me see if if there's something else that I haven't mentioned. Um, I'm looking at, at, at your notes actually. Um, well, I think you know uh, one one key small task that we should do and, and perhaps is embedded uh, between lines in, in what we discussed uh, on Friday is that we need to map or, or, or point out where exactly this analysis fits into the whole you know idea of and, and I guess this is comes from the conservation committee right uh, if if they've if they've thought about specific management strategies or development of policies or is it because it's more uh, towards uh, raising awareness or is it because we want to develop a new financial mechanism such as a payment for ecosystem service or a, a carbon offset as the one that Ralph was mentioning last time. I think having that uh, written in, in or mapped in, in, in the whole process is, is key because the ecosystem services functions and valuation methods that we develop, we need to take in consideration where are we heading, right? So um, I, I think that that should be somewhere. We, we should have such as a, a process, an overarching process or, or what's, what's our end goal here. And it could be part of, what Bob and I presented on how to develop, for example, a common asset trust where you had, you know, 
which is your ecosystem, what are the services, what are the main threats, uh, etc. So that that helps you, you know, to guide each discussion in each one of the groups towards a, a, a common goal. And, and, and I think we might be missing a little bit of, of that right now. Uh, we also spoke about the impacts of climate change on, on how this could make environmental uh, ecosystem functions or and or services uh, change in different parts of the world. And that was based on what uh, David Cook uh, presented. And, and, and especially I'm very interested in, in, in that since, for example, in Costa Rica, we have a whole community that depends entirely on whale watching. And so how could that be impacted by climate change? Um, we also spoke about modeling. So I think, uh, I don't know if the modeling group, how much have they worked already, but having this conversation with the modeling group is essential to see how we're thinking about ecosystem services and functions and how we should be modeling it into the overall ecosystem health and the economic uh, impact of certain sectors. So all of those very complex interactions, we, we need to model them. And um, so having that conversation with that team, I think it's uh, essential right now. And we could also model those different interactions uh, under different uh, scenarios, uh, which we often do to see those trade-offs depending on, on policies or threats, et cetera. Um, and I think one, one thing that uh, Robert Costanza proposed at the end of his talk was if we could bring to the agenda the, the creation, and this is part of the work that we've been doing on, on creating a common asset trust, uh, which is an institutional and financial framework uh, for, for, the, for common resources and citations here are one of the, our greatest challenges because are those transboundary common resources. So uh, developing the financial institutional framework, we, we spoke about that. In the, I think if we could put it into the agenda somewhere, it, it would be highly, highly valuable. Um, what else? I think that was that was all, Barbara. But but you please tell me if if I, if I missed anything. I mean, I'm saying it in a very general way, right? We went through very specific part. Thank you, Marcelo. Yes, I think it's very clear the, the, the introduction of the different topics that we addressed. DJ has his raised hand. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, thank you, Barbara. I don't have anything to add to Marcelo's summary. I would just note two things in regards to Marcelo's mention of the ecosystem modeling work that's being done, as I explained um, on the Friday small group call. And, and for those of you who don't know, the scientific committee has already had one workshop on this issue and a second workshop is being planned that will specifically address the modeling side of this, at least you know, from a scientific perspective. And just listening to Marcelo, it might be valuable, and this is certainly something I could take to the um, person, Toshi, who, who spoke on day one of the workshop and make the suggestion, or, or I would invite uh, Rebecca to do the same thing. But for those participating or, or organizing that workshop, they might want to consider inviting uh, Marcelo or uh, another economist or two to attend that workshop so they can understand sort of the modeling side that the scientists are, are pursuing and, and perhaps um, make some suggestions on how that those models could be um, uh, articulated or, or how they could be populated in such a way that the end result could provide something of use to the economists. So that's that's just one suggestion. The other thing was with which is just a comment and I at least I'm speaking for myself and I imagine maybe for, for others of you, I think this has been 
a very eye-opening workshop for me because I'm not trained as an um, economist. I'm trained as a biologist. And so understanding or hearing from the economists who, who have made presentations, it gives me a better perspective as to what kinds of things that they think about and how they think. And, and certainly there's a lot more to be learned, but I think that's been one of the struggles for me is trying to uh, understand that world that I certainly don't live in and, and, and to apply sort of that mindset to you know, what was discussed at the first scientific committee workshop and, and sort of my just understanding of, of the ecosystem services provided by cetaceans. So it's been very, uh, very educational. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. We take note of your suggestion to invite uh, some economists to, the, to attend the, 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 work, the second scientific committee workshop on modeling. And uh, Rebecca is uh, asking for the floor. Please, Rebecca, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Chair. It, I think it's, uh, it's been very eye-opening to listen to all of the talks. And as I said um, at our first day of the meeting, it really takes a lot of courage to start exploring a whole other area of science. I do consider economics to be a science. I think we should uh, embrace that, but at the same time recognize that it would be helpful perhaps to have uh, some kind of a study uh, that would look at some of the key issues, maybe select um, two or three topics in particular, and see if we could have some economists specialized in this non-market uh, valuation area of economics to provide some general background for us and some guidance as to where we might find the most productive uh, outputs to look at that are, that are most relevant and most immediate to our, um, our concerns about ecosystem services. So I um, look forward to the next steps and welcome an opportunity to be involved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rebecca. Indeed, this is, has been a very interesting and challenging workshop. Has, it is the first time we are addressing this topic uh, openly uh, as, a, as a group, as an international community. And uh, I would also like to thank Marcello for the introduction to the small uh, working group. And I would like to know if there is any further comment before we move in. Okay, so just Lorenzo, yes, please. Yeah, I have a, probably a, a naive question. If it, choosing a species, but also choosing a species that has some value just for the exercise and see how we progress with that one, like well watching, could that be a good thing? Uh, well, Marcello and all those who participated in in the small working group and have discussed this, or that's just a dead end idea and wouldn't work. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you, Lorenzo. Marcello, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's that's that could be part of the criteria, right? And and here we we would be, you know, evaluating what we call the total ecosystem value, right? And so uh, perhaps if we choose, I don't know, humpback whales or gray whales that um, are very valuable from the point of view of whale watching, then we could say that on top of providing a certain amount of money to, you know, to coastal communities when they're not there uh, supporting that industry and they are in their migration, uh, you know, yeah, corridors, migra migratory corridors, they are also providing other services. So this helps also to build the case for sustainable whale watching, et cetera. So I think if choosing one species that we already know that provides services could certainly be uh, very, very valuable. And, and thank you, Rebecca, for including us as scientists, because uh, I think we need to broaden up the, the concept of scientists. <laughs> Thanks. 
Thank you, uh, Marcello and Lorenzo, for your question. Um, okay, just to summarize a little bit what, what has been done and the steps, next steps that we should uh, advance with the IWC work at the Conservation Committee. We first have already worked on the scientific information threats related to, the, to ecosystem uh, functions. And we know we need to do more work and go through this table. We will do it with the small working group. Just has a very basic and first step for the workshop report. Then there was the proposal to have a, a pilot project on one species. It was suggested as the North Atlantic rally whale, but it can be other species. So this is another more, not such short term like the analysis or filling off the table with the small working group. So there will be needed to develop probably some terms of reference for that pilot project and uh, perhaps identify the species before in advance or after, I don't know. And I would suggest there is the work conservation committee working group on uh, cetacean and ecosystem functioning. And perhaps if Lorenzo thinks so, that would be a good uh, group to discuss and develop this framework for pilot project if, if the workshop participant, and of course, this is an outcome that is uh, envisaged for and accepted by, by the group. This is, will be probably the, the first step. Yes, Lorenzo? Uh, sorry, I was trying to understand what you were suggesting on the Conservation Committee. You want to have this group from the Conservation Committee integrate to, or the other way around, integrate the small working group to this uh, Conservation Committee group. Is that what you were suggesting? And let me explain why I, uh, I would like that. In previous um, meetings and when we had the 75th anniversary of IWC, I suggested that we need more social uh, and economic, and I will say scientists, I have never had a doubt in my mind that, that, that you are scientists in the social and economic science. So that could be a way also to bring this part that is missing in the conservation committee to work with jointly and, and probably start that uh, process in the conservation committee. So uh, I hope I'm making myself, myself clear here. Thanks. Thank you, Lorenzo. So yes, we are in line with that. Uh, I was, yes, the small working group perhaps don't want to go to work further beyond the, the analysis of the table, but uh, we can invite them to the umbrella of the intersessional working group of the Conservation Committee on this topic. And certainly we will invite uh, the socioeconomic scientists to, to, to attend. Uh, the, these sessions has, it would be important to developing the terms of reference for a pilot project or a workshop or an expert panel. I don't know how this will uh, be take forward in, in the future, but just for the record that the work will be will continue after the adoption of the workshop report under the conservation committee intersectional working group to continue with the this step so this would be the first very basic step that is to analyze uh, the, the the information and work on it for pilot project one species so we can know and during this process we will come to the second point that was associate valuation methods and asset socioeconomic potential i don't know lorenzo if you are asking for the floor or it's uh, the, the hand that was right left over let's say sorry okay um 
So this is the valuation methods that we already knew about it. There was also a proposition when we do the pilot project from the small working groups, some thoughts that were discussed. And there was two issues. One that was already appeared today is the terms to be used as ecosystem services. Not all of us understand the same for the same ecosystem services, or we don't use the same terms. So it, it's sometimes a little confusing. And this will be probably some of the uh, uh, the aspect that will be needed to be covered by the group when developing the pilot project. And also in associating the valuation method, there has been discussions on that the, there needs to be a direct benefit for humans, but not necessarily. And then we move to the uh, table 1B, which are many functions that are not directly related to human benefits, but there was a state preference method introduced by uh, Dr. Johnson. And there was also some discussions during in this working group that perhaps uh, some of them or the health of the ocean could be valued from this, uh, the non-use uh, alternative could be valued by these other methods, non-economically directed, but then to have them included and not left outside if there is a no directly modeling biological relation between uh, the, 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 the function and the services provided by the way. So this was the second issue and I think over the days, there has been many uh, discussions on why, if it's not directly related, but has uh, Dr. Johnson's provided an example, the people value the ecosystem uh, healthy, even if it was not a direct benefit to them, they transform it by this method into a direct benefit to them. So try to explore that. What participants are, agree if there is someone that would suggest something else, please raise your hand while I am uh, advancing. The third consideration, but this will probably, even if the valuation methods and the relation of scientific information with the uh, ecosystem services and their valuation, will be probably go at the same time. There was also a very important topic that was uh, concerned and raised during this uh, presentation by Dr. Cook. And it was to consider the impacts of climate change on the variability of cetaceans ecosystem functions through time. This is very important topic has we now today we have for granted all these ecosystem uh, services provided. And we said, if the whales uh, continue to recover, we will have more benefits. But depending on the future scenarios of climate change, we might be losing, which is even worse, all the current ecosystem services we are receiving uh, from the contribution of cetacean to ecosystem functioning. So that's another important topic that probably we will have, or the International Whaling Commission will have to address and model in the future, but we are at very early stage. So we discussed that on the small working group, but we believed it is too premature to modeling that if we still don't model the basic pilot project and really start to uh, give some ground to those discussions. So these were the three major, from a modeling perspective, outputs of this workshop, according to the discussions. But there was a fourth one that Martello already addressed and Selena today also pointed out, 
and it's the development of an institutional framework, a governance approach, and the financial system associated with that. This is not about modeling. This is about conversations among different states, particularly with migratory species that live most of their time in, at high seas. So there is an opportunity that conversations could be started by the IWC in parallel with whatever uh, mathematical modeling, socioeconomical uh, modeling we could advance. So these are the four major topics. I will now give the floor to the participants has to include on the recommendations of this workshop over these four topics. If you have any uh, idea, suggestion to move forward these four uh, major tasks that have been identified over the, the workshop. So thank you. Is there any comments or proposals for recommendation of the future work? This will go and move to the, the workshop report will go to the commission. So there will be further discussion on whatever is here recommended. The commission will need to review it and discuss about it. Isabel, thanks. Uh, thank you, Barbara. No, just a, a short comment that I think uh, that is not only not only climate change will change the the, the cetaceans and also the the positive uh, inputs of for the ecosystem. There is also, for example, the traffic, cheap traffic, uh, noise, and 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 several that will affect. For example, the distribution of the species and also will change uh, the, the occurrence of some species in coastal areas like the Juanpa wells. We have seen that in, in, in a site in Colombia that there are so many traffic that now the, the Juanpa wells are uh, are each year uh, um, not so close to the coastal like 30 years ago. Then it's also it's, it's only this comment, yeah, that we need also the threats. Uh, for um, there are also other threats that are also important for this analysis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, we totally agree, and uh, we will consider it to include on, on the report. Selina, please go ahead. Um, thank you. I think this workshop for me has been a really fascinating example of interdisciplinary working. And I think a glossary on some of the terms um, might be helpful. Just a couple of things in context. Um, the focus on ecosystem services. I mean, the UK is putting a big emphasis on this, as it is with natural capital, nature-based solutions, next, um, net zero, whichever is the latest fad. But I just want to emphasize that importance of governance, you know, really ensuring that the, the science, the policy, that it is aligned with government priorities. Otherwise, you just don't get the political will. So I think this has been fantastic and I'm being intentionally provocative, but it's very academic, some of these discussions. I've been in lots of workshops where we've argued about you know, which variables to measure, which parameters for models, which assumptions. And my point is that it is ultimately about managing people's behavior and without that, you have to get people engaged and to get them engaged, you've got to have good governance. So I'm just reflecting because I've loved the workshop. <laughs> I've spent 20, 20, 30 years trying to nail interdisciplinary research, although my passion is sharks and sea cucumbers, but I'm coming round to whales. So I just wanted to share those reflections and to say it sounds a really great group of people, um, but please don't forget the science policy framing, the science diplomacy, and that governance, how you actually make it work. Otherwise, all the efforts will not really realize the um, true benefits. 
And I so wished I could get more involved, um, but forgive me, I've only started a new job. I'm three months in. So um, hopefully I'll be able to pick up with you again at a later date and wish you good luck. And thank you again for inviting me to be part of your workshop. Thank you, Selina, very much for being a speaker today and presenting and being on the workshop supporting all these uh, giving new directions toward the future work. It's very important. We realize these four topics related to development of a financial and institutional framework and, uh, and achieve a government governance structure it's of high importance. It was not really uh, addressed at the uh, agenda of the workshop, just like probably at the very last part for recommendations, but this come very early in the workshop, these suggestions. Um, we take point of that. And I would like for you and Marcelo, has this come uh, pro from proposal from you, what would be your suggestions on uh, how we could uh, set up this uh, common asset trust or financial institution, how the IWC could uh, start these uh, discussions, conversation or move toward that direction? Thank you. Uh, Marcello. Uh, and then uh, Selena, I will come back to you again. Marcelo. Thank, thank you. So how, how can we bring the IWC to, to these models that uh, governance mo models that we were speaking? Uh, well, that, that's, that's part of the institutional framework that, that we want to build around our common asset trust for, for the ocean at, at different levels, right? So, so the idea is it's not, it's not the government, it's not the private sector, it's not the international organizations, it's, it's how can we organize all of these key actors uh, and how can we apply a set of rules that are efficient to provide the, the strategies that, that we need for, for conservation and restoration. And, and we, we base those, those rules on Eleanor Ostrom's uh, eight principles of, of governance. So, uh, I don't have a, a, a specific question on how to bring IWC right, right now. I, I guess that, uh, of course, both from, from the scientific uh, point of view and also what also Selena was mentioning, scientific diplomacy and how different global commons interact because the problem on, on, on whale conservation is also a problem of, of, on terrestrial uh, commons on coastal commons on high sea commons. So um, I think if, if we can have the, the feedback of IWC in the development of this common asset trust for, for the oceans would, would be highly valuable and, and we could have you know some some calls or even a workshop on, on how how to incorporate them and how make it an instrumental part of this orchestra that we're putting together. Thank you, Marcello. Selina. Um, that's a difficult question. Um, as I hinted with the IC's working group I'm part of, they didn't have socioeconomic working groups. So I think the fact that you're recognizing the importance of those, and I've emphasized the social, is important for science. For me, what it's a crowded space, even though it's the UN Ocean um, Decade for Ocean Science, and you're focusing on the very iconic species where you've got IUCN and various other organizations. But if you're going to get the attention of governments, you need to also um, align some of your goals, for example, to food security to alternative livelihoods. So, you know, governments, they tend to think in these much more global challenges. So I think you could perhaps, and maybe I'm, I don't know, sorry, all your literature, this may have been done, but being able to more explicitly align to the sustainable development goals, actually showing solutions, but in real time, 
you know, that is what a lot of governments are spending some time on. So that I think that's one way to perhaps increase the visibility if it's not already done. Um, but then just coming back to that locally, really understanding which particular communities and um, fishers, why they break rules, why they will or will not support particular management measurements, that really does require um, very skillful anthropologists, interdisciplinary teams to get that trust and to understand. And I would really, I'm biased, but that's where I put most of my effort. I'm a trained marine biologist, spent those eight years in two social science departments, thought they were speaking another language, but then actually realized that it's about influencing governments and resources and the policy. So um, yeah. I hope that helps a little bit. I could go on and on. It's something I feel very passionate about. And I'm just really thrilled you're addressing these questions. Thank you uh, very much, Salina and Marcello for your, for your reflections. Mar Marcello, yes. And I just, just to uh, do a follow up of what Salina was saying, I, I think if we link it to these other global you know uh goals such as sdgs for example if, if we have food security and we were saying that whales could be part of those you know ocean ecosystem engineers that helps increase the productivity of fisheries then you can link that to sdg 14 of of, of the ocean but also other ones such as food, food security so it, it conservation of whales becomes a matter of food security in some places right uh, so, so those are the types of arguments that are highly attractive for 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 policy decisions, right? And and um, just just one side comment, and, and I think governance could exist without the the government, uh, as we as we know it, as we have seen in, in traditional communities how they organize themselves um, independently from from the government. So uh, I think that's part of the current considerations that we might keep in, it would be useful to keep in mind. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, Serena. Just a very quick point, because I wanted to give credit actually to Bob Constance, and I really enjoyed your paper, Marcelo, as I have all the papers, but I actually used his paper evaluation, the oceans, to get a degree accredited at Aberdeen University. It was in the first marine resource management accredited by the planning um, the Royal Town Planning Institution. And I mentioned that because I think this valuation, if we can just balance it with non-monetary, those social, then I think, again, that is an area where there could be more work. So um, but I wanted to make sure, because um, it was so lovely to see Bob and Marcella present those papers, and that he should get credit for those, um, helping me win the arguments for those degrees, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Salina. So I, we will take notes from your suggestion to include has a recommendations of the workshop that includes uh, align this to the sustainable development goals or any other global challenges. Um, that it will be needed also to create a, a an interdisciplinary unskilled group to develop any um, governance framework and also to uh, balance the economic valuation, market or non-market, but economic valuation from one point of view to it. also the other uh, non-monetary valuation that could be considered as the ones that uh, Selina provides us in the during the presentation to address uh, also the different groups. These are all the possibilities that could be done with the panel expert workshop or whatever, either at the pilot project or in advance, but these are the ideas on the table today. There is uh, five minutes uh, left and I will give the floors for the last comments, recommendations, suggestions, proposals from this uh, workshop before closing the, the, the sessions and the workshop that has been very, very interesting. Any additional comments from the floor? 
suggestions, proposals? It seems known. So thank you very, very much, everybody, for attending the workshop, especially the speakers that has been uh, contributing so much to the workshop, to enlightening us. I see Lorenzo that raised the hand before we say well, before, goodbye. Before you say goodbye, Chair, I would like to thank you for your excellent work. I mean, it's not easy to organize uh, these type of multidisciplinary workshops when you are a biologist and you are able to find the proper people to enlighten us. I think you did a fantastic job and I'd really like to congratulate you and also all the speakers that were fantastic. So thanks so much for that. Thank you, Lorenzo. I agree yes. with Lorenzo. Thank you, Javier. Gracias. So I have a Rebecca also. Rebecca, yes, just a, a quick note to thank everybody for being engaged in this workshop. It's very unusual what you've done. You've really broken new ground. And uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for your leadership, all the speakers and all the participants. Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, it has been a very incredible and uh, enlightening workshop with many challenges and many work. We believe we will be finish the workshop with a very uh, nice and structured way forward. And now we have increased the amount of work <laughs> as usually. And I, I also would like to thank all the participants for uh, being in the workshop and have this brainstorming that is the first time we are discussing this and being so much interdisciplinary, we are very used at the IWC to have a scientific committee workshop, very scientific related. So this is quite a new approach and it's very uh, give hopes for the future to move towards a new shift in paradigm and try to get international organizations such as the International Whaling Commission to contribute to these efforts worldwide because we know we are running out of time for the conservation of the seas and cetaceans and these are opportunities that everybody is contributing to. So thank you very much and thanks the speakers again for all the speakers they couldn't be all of them today but I take the opportunity to thank all the speakers for their contribution and accepting to uh, participate at the workshop and be so enthusiastic with everything. And I would also like to thank again the secretariat and the and all the staff for uh, for 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 the incredible work they did organizing this workshop. And we would like also to thank the rapporteurs for being all, have all this work until today. And certainly they will continue to work for a few days more. And I will also especially want to thank Marcello for his continual contribution and over the workshop and the leadership in the small working group. Thank you very much for that. Has have been very welcome. helpful to get out of the uh, discussions and bring new lights to how to uh, advance with the, this work. So thank you everybody very much for the workshop, and we are happy that the in international. Whaling Commission is a good place to start delivering this, me this message out to the entire community. It is a collaborative work within different countries and among different actors that will make it possible to happen. And we are here today, and of course the sessions before, attending this workshop to contribute to this effort. So Cetash and I providing us with so much and we have to pay them back by contributing more efforts into the, the conservation. But 
it is a win-win situation. Uh, there is an, an invitation now to get everybody on board. Thank you all for your contribution. A summary will be distributed to the scientific committee. Um, that will take place uh, in a few weeks, but it will be only a short summary for information that the scientific committee requested to know how this work uh, was conducted or developed. And the report will be circulated for comments before it is made public, and it will be then presented at the next IWC Conservation Committee and uh, plenary meetings. Uh, thank you very much for such a good and excellent workshop. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.